Yeah, that's right, we're back with another video. And for this one, I thought I'd use a load of archive footage to edit together one big backyard mini ramp 101 video. Now this detail is my process for designing, building, owning, maintaining and modifying the ramp. And I'm hoping that there'll be a few ideas in there that will help you in your quest for building your own DIY mini ramp. Anyway, enough of my yakking, let's get straight into it. Okay, I've just been to Dorchester Timber, got myself some wood. In the kit list are three eight by four sheets of 18 mil ply. Those will do the sides of the quarter pipes and also the platforms. One sheet will allow me to cut out two transitions and then I'm gonna split the other one in half so I get two two foot wide platforms. I also got 34 eight foot lengths of two by four. Those will do the beams across and also make the flat bottom. The other things I got were 15 breeze blocks to stand the whole ramp on. And I also found some concrete path edging with a round top 50 millimeters. And I'm gonna use that for makeshift coping. I couldn't find any scaffold pole, but I really like concrete coping. I'm gonna go for that pool vibe. So I'm hoping that this concrete coping lacquered up will work. I also got myself a truckload of screws. I got 400 decking screws and I got 200 big long 100 mil screws to do the beam work. I've got some paint and some bits and bobs in the shed. So I bought myself a paintbrush and a roller so I can paint things as we go. I think we're ready to get cracking. Okay, just drawing out the transition radius. I've rigged up my kite line, which is really low stretch. Six foot 10 on the radius. Just pop my pencil in. I've experimented with various radiuses and I think this one will work. Sketch it across, keep the line tight. And then I've got my transition radius. Next job, cut it out. Okay, that's the four transitions cut. I've gone for a three foot height and a six and a half foot radius. Hopefully that will mean that I can still get a good clearance when I rock the board and go for board slides. I'm gonna paint these now to protect them from the weather, and then it's gonna be a case of putting the struts across. Okay, I'm gonna try out an experimental idea, some concrete coping. I've given these a sand down, and now I'm gonna give them a few coats of clear coat just to get them nice and slippery. Here we go. Okay, it's an early start on day two. All the transitions are finished and painted, looking quite splendid. Just marking off every 10 inches where the beams need to go. Then I'm gonna drill the holes and stick the beams in and the quarter pipes should start to take shape. Exciting times. Okay, that's the flat bottom finished. Pretty excited, starting to really look like a ramp now. Less exciting is trying to prepare the base, so I'm gonna to have to take this out and then start putting the breeze blocks in place and measuring them and making sure everything's flat. That's all the foundations leveled off. I've put the breeze blocks in and put some chocks underneath. It's all level. Whew, that took a while, but it was worth doing. Next job is to stick the decks on. It's an early start on day three. Let's take a closer look at how this coping fits on. So if you have a look, there's a pocket I've created. There's a piece of wood at the back which alters the height. And also this is gonna be held down with an extra bit of wood on the top. And then the deck is gonna come across and pinch it from the top. 
and then the ramp is going to come up from behind and pinch it so it should be pretty stable i don't want to glue or anchor this in because the idea is that if this wears out at 30 quid for the whole coping i can just drop some new coping in also to start with i just want to be able to adjust it to exactly the right height so i'm going to ride it a little bit and if it's too tall or if it's not enough coping i can come in and adjust this back rod up and down until i'm happy first job this morning is a lot of painting i'm going to paint all these ply sheets back and front ready to put in but it's an exciting day because by the end of the day there's a good chance i might be in some position to have a ride a bit of this crazy Gorilla Glue stuff to put the two coping blocks together. I toyed with the idea of sticking some cement in between but I think this structure is going to flex a little bit and that's going to immediately crack and flake off so I'm hoping this will bend and move a little bit more the Gorilla Glue. Once this is dry I'm going to sand it back so that it's nice and flat and then I'm going to put loads of lacquer and sauce over the top. Hopefully that will strengthen the join and it won't be so liable to chip. I've never tried this before and I don't think I've seen this sort of done, so it's a bit of a trial and error situation. I'm hoping it works out, but if it doesn't, or if it only lasts for six months, I can always drop some extra ones in, just because these stones are so cheap. Once these are in place, I'm going to chock them from behind, and then I'm going to put the deck on, and that should hopefully hold the whole lot in place in a sturdy fashion. Okay, I've finished the coping and I've also painted the decks. While those are drying, it's finally time to put the first layer of ply on. Well, that's the bottom layer of ply on. I've done it so I can squeeze the two halves together to get a really tight fit on the final join. So I'm gonna put the next lot on, see where that lies to, and then I can then push the tranny up to the middle of the bottom, make sure that all the ply fits really snug. Just doing some work on the coping now. This Gorilla Glue has worked really well. It holds them firmly in place. Just getting a file and making sure that that is totally flat across the top so the truck can't catch and cause wear. And then I'm gonna put loads and loads of lacquer all over the top and I'm hoping that'll protect that joint. Well, that's it for a busy day three. Managed to get that plywood on. It's really looking like a ramp now. Found some fence paint in the shed and I've put that on as a precautionary measure just to protect the ply. Obviously, you're not gonna see this when the top layer of ply is on. Top layer of ply is going on tomorrow, lacquering the coping tomorrow and putting the decks on. So hopefully, we should be riding. Okay, it's day four, just a few jobs left. Number one, cut a little infill for this side here and paint it blue. Number two, lacquer the coping. It's a job I'm particularly looking forward to. It's so satisfying to get the lacquer on and see how that coping's gonna be finished. Number three, get the decks fitted. And number four, put the final layer of ply on. I'm gonna do some more bracing as well and put some more posts in just to support the structure. After all of that, hopefully, we should be able to get our first skate. Okay, the time has finally come to spray the coping. I've been looking forward to this for ages. I've given it a good sand down and made sure that these joints are nice and smooth. Got some clear coat lacquer here. So if I spray this on, hopefully she should come up a tree. I'm gonna give it two or three coats, then I can fit the deck and the ply and we should be good to go. time to fit the platforms. I've put a 45 degree angle on the front of this platform so when I put it up against the coping it'll fit snugly and also lock the coping down in place add a little bit of extra stability. I'm going to screw these in. Okay I'm just fitting these top sheets just to save missing the beams with the screws I'm going down and marking out 
where each beam is and putting a faint pencil line across, that means when the screw goes in, it hits the beam. There's nothing worse than missing a beam. The screw spins round, doesn't catch, then you can't get it back out. Oh my gosh, leaves a hole. Woo! Bit of prep. Hopefully she'll be good. Well, that's all the top ply on now. I still need to paint the top ply, do a bit of filling, and also I'm gonna put some more posts in to support it, but I can't wait to give it a quick run. I'm gonna start with a few rock fakies just to see how it feels. This is my first time in. Woohoo! to start with, if it feels good under the skateboards when it's dry, I'm going to do the whole ramp to protect it. Okay, a little tip for putting the first coat of paint on, you just need to water it down by half just so it gets into the wood. The wood's quite thirsty. Also, it does bring a little bit of the grain out, so I've gone over and sanded the whole first coat down, ready for the second coat. I've also taken the time just to fill any gaps and imperfections, so hopefully when I put this second coat on, we should be golden. When I sit all finished, got the top coat of paint on, I couldn't resist just putting a facsimile of the tiles at the top to go with the concrete coping. I've also concreted in more supports and painted the side blue, put this filler piece in the side so she is ready to go. This cheap masonry paint seems to have done the job. Two coats and it's dried. It's got a similar grip level to concrete. When you slide the wheels, it makes that familiar sound. As a final last touch, I've taken a highlighter pen and I've drawn in the grout to complete the tile effect. Okay, that's it for the backyard mini ramp build. I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out, but on reflection, here are a few things that I learned during the process. Number one, try not to rush. This is an exciting build and my mind was always fixated on riding the ramp and getting to a point where I could test the transition and see if that coping worked. So holding back a little bit, painting things in order, not rushing it, really could save some time. There was times when I had to take things apart because I'd already put them together to see how they looked and then I really wasted a lot of time doing that. Number two, beg, steal or borrow the best tools you can. I didn't really have a great array of tools. A bad workman always blames his tools. I'm a bad workman, I'm blaming my tools. Luckily, my mate Matt Jenkins has got a plethora of world-class tools because he's a tradesman and he was kind enough to help me out cutting the big long ply sheets and also cutting that 45 degree angle which proved to be really important to get a snug fit on the coping and to get everything to line up. So get some good tools if you can. Number three, measure twice, cut once. That old cliche works a treat and it ties in with trying not to rush. So it's worth just taking your time, measuring everything twice so you only have to cut it once. Number four, level the ground. It's really important to have level ground for the quarter pipes. Not so much so that you're riding up or down a hill because you can compensate for that and you can ride quirky little bits of ramp. But the problem is, is that if the ramp isn't straight, when you put the ply on, it's sort of on a wonk and then it won't fit down properly and it'll also create gaps between the ply. So I found that when I offered up the ply the first time, my ramp wasn't perfectly straight and I couldn't work out why I couldn't get it all to fit together. I had to trace back, undo everything, level it all off and go back in. Again, it wasted loads of time because I was being too hasty to try and get it all in done first. So level out your foundation. Number five, paint all the edges of the plywood at least. If you can, paint all of the surfaces of all exposed wood. What I've tried to do is try to stem the tide and also make the underneath sheets as durable as possible. The idea being maybe every season, I just need to redo the top layer, but hopefully all of the bottom stuff will still be intact. So the bottom sheets that you're not gonna ride on, you're not gonna see, I just 
really gave them a dose of cuprinol and wood preserver in an attempt to try and keep those good. For the top coat, I've used masonry paint. Seems to work really well. It'll breathe, but it's waterproof. And also it gives you loads of grip. You can get squeaky wheels on it and you can get whatever shade you want for the top. So a bit of masonry paint, job's a good one. You could also invest in a cover just to keep the worst of the weather off and also stop any pooling. I think the pooling of water would really eat into the whole ramp and it would take a while for that to dry out. Number six, allow a little bit more room in the budget. I found that there's always an extra pot of screws, an extra brush, bit of paint, an extra bit of two by four, another bag of postcrete. All those things add up over and above what you think you're gonna spend. I still need to put some safety railings on the back, so that's another eight bits of two by four wood that I've gotta go and buy. And that all adds up, so a little bit more extra room in the budget, oh yeah. Number seven, brace as much as you can. I found when I did my first few runs, the ramp was flexing a bit. So I went back in and just put an extra brace underneath the coping, also some braces around the side, some noggins. Basically, the more bracing you can put in, the more solid the ramp is gonna feel. Number eight, just get twice as many screws as you think you'll need. I started off with 600 screws. I think I ended up using double that. This is a screw hungry project. The first thing I added to my original build were these safety rails. It became immediately apparent that falling off the back of this from three foot up wasn't gonna be too pleasant. I also extended the platforms by another foot. They're originally two foot, which was absolutely fine, but I found just that extra wiggle room was really helpful when you're trying things like the sweeper and the can opener. So platform extensions and extra safety rails really worked out a treat. The next thing I added were these sacrificial softwood strips. These concrete posts are really jagged on the edge and I was finding that my board was going headlong into it, denting the nose and denting the tail. These softwood strips have been really helpful. The board just plows into those, the softwood takes the brunt of it and the board remains undinged. After riding the ramp a bit, I was finding that there was a little bit of flexing here and there. So I went round and just put in extra supports, concreted in some posts, and also put in some noggins underneath, and that helped to really get the ramp nice and stiff and ride nicely. I think that's something that you can do once you've built your mini ramp, just go around and work out where those points of flex are and brace accordingly. Before I fitted a guardrail on this end of the ramp, I was quite enjoying being able to film tricks unhindered without a guardrail in the way, so I decided to make this guardrail removable. All you do is just pull straight up and she pops out and then you can film your tricks without having to look through the rail. I've got a fern on this end, which is quite fun to dive into. But generally, if I'm gonna do a trick where I feel I'm gonna fall backwards, I just slot this bad boy back in and then there's no falling off the back. Woo Those of you who watched part one of the video will remember that I improvised some pool coping with these concrete paving slabs. I couldn't find any steel coping in lockdown, and so I went down my local DIY shop just before it closed and got these 50 mil concrete paving slabs. Stuck loads of lacquer on the top and popped them in. Had loads of questions about how these worked out, and I have to say they were a joy to skate. Really good for grinds and really quiet. The only issue was where. I had to keep on lacquering these. There was a lot of upkeep. The front truck was coming down like a pickaxe and knocking holes out of the concrete. I had to fill those in and then lacquer it again. So there was a whole lot of work involved in having this style of concrete coping. When I got the steel coping, I whacked it on. Little bit of expanding foam to try and keep the noise down. And it grinds a treat, zero upkeep. Oh my gosh. So really enjoying the steel coping, but I think the concrete coping was a worthwhile experiment and it got me through a couple of months before I got the steel coping. Next up, I had quite a few questions about the paint that I used. This is really cheap masonry paint, 12 quid for five liters. And I have to say it's worked out a treat. The biggest worry with sticking paint on a ramp is whether it's gonna affect the grip on the wheels. And I have to say the masonry paint <laughs> really grips nicely and the wheels make that familiar sound that you get on concrete. It's really worn nicely. I'll put another couple of coats on just to be safe. 
I use a cover to keep the worst of the wetness off, but the ramp still has got wet a couple of times and it's come out a treat, absolutely no problem. So I think painting the ramp with masonry paint will definitely give it a longer life. And it's also improved the skate feel, giving it a bit more grip than just the normal ply. I think the most common question I got asked about the mini ramp build was the dimensions that I chose. I did quite a lot of research, went to various ramps, measured them, found some ramps that I found really comfortable to skate and then thought about using those transitions. My key objective for the ramp was to aid my progression. So I wanted to learn a lot of tricks on this ramp and for that process to be as easy as possible. So I went for a six and a half foot radius. I tried to make the ramp as long as I had space for. I think it's 22 foot all in all. And then height wise, I thought I'd go for three foot to start with, but it just looked mental. So I cut it down a bit, just under three foot. I think there was a little bit of luck involved, but the ramp skates really nicely. I couldn't ask for more. I think on reflection, I could probably cope with slightly steeper transitions now, but when I built the ramp three months ago, they were plenty steep enough and they've really aided my progress. So I think six and a half foot really worked nicely for me with what I wanted to achieve. Another idea I experimented with was having a grind bar down the side. I was thinking while you're going backwards and forwards, what if you could do a trick on the way back to the next coping. So I tried a grind bar down the side, see if I could do slappy grinds and 50-50s. It worked okay, but to be honest, it was lethal. And if you came off of anything on the coping, there was just another thing to get snagged and caught up on. So I decided to take it off. I think I might revise a design and come back to it, maybe build a bit of a transition onto it so it's more of a mini bowl as opposed to a slappy bar. I've had a few requests to see the ramp in action. So here's a selection of some of the tricks I've learned since I built the mini ramp. I think overall it's the size of this mini ramp which has aided my progression the most. All of the mini ramps in my area are a little bit bigger than this, just a bit too big to be comfortable trying things and not getting hurt. I've come an absolute cropper off of this size of mini ramp onto my spongy plywood build and it's always worked out pretty much okay. So I've got total confidence flying into various tricks on this ramp. And that is the thing I think that's helped me the most to progress. Okay, that's it for build a pool inspired mini ramp part two. I think overall, I'm really pleased with how the ramp turned out. I got lucky on the dimensions and the overall design. It really fulfilled the design brief of aiding my progression. The addition of the safety barriers was essential and also making those decks a little wider also worked to treat. As for little tweaks I might add in the future, I'm certainly flirting with the idea of adding a four foot extension to bring in the ramp from eight foot wide to 12 foot wide. It's fine at eight foot, especially for stalls and those sort of things, but for longer grinds and also slash grinds, etc., you can't really have too much width. So that extra four foot would be a lovely feature. Could also make that a little bit higher as well. So it could be four foot wide and a four foot extension. Oh, not off. I think the winter will be a really good test of the paint. I bought a cover and it's got a UV side on it. So I keep that on in the summer months, try and keep the UV off and also the damp. And then I can flick it over in the winter onto the heavy duty side just to keep all the rain off. Hopefully she'll make it through the winter. If not, it won't be the end of the world if I just have to replace these top sheet supply when the spring comes. Today we're going to be focusing on dampening the noise down on the ramp. It's become a bit of an unwieldy beast, I want to keep the neighbourhoods on side, so I'm going to dampen down the sound. To do this I'm going to do four different methods, 
see which ones are effective, and then review the process at the end. First method, fit softer wheels. Step two, dampen the resonance of the wood panels. Step three, dampen the resonance of the steel coping. And step four, box in the ends to try and stop the noise coming out of these big amplifier boom boxes. So we can review how effective these dampening methods are. I'm gonna take audio recordings of me riding the ramp with my normal hard wheels, and then riding the ramp with my soft wheels, and then riding the ramp when it's all dampened with the hard wheels, and then riding the ramp when it's all dampened with the soft wheels. I'm then gonna stick them in the computer and we can actually see and hear how much noise reduction and dampening has occurred with the techniques we're using. I've put together a short run of some of the most common noisy tricks. I'm gonna drop in, do an axle store to get that chink chink on the coping, come down, do a rocks of fakie, and then do a little fakie pop so I can get an explosive noise hitting down on the coping. So here's how the ramp sounds currently with no dampening and my hard compound wheels. Okay, so I've selected some soft compound wheels. These are exactly the same shape and size as my normal wheels, so I'm hoping they'll feel the same when I lock onto the coping, but they're 87A compound, and they're specially made for filming video parts, so the guy holding the camera can skate along and not create any extra noise going into the camera. So these are OJ 55 millimeter filming 87A soft wheels. Let's have a listen. Those softer wheels have definitely made a difference, reducing that riding noise. I'm quite impressed with those. 87A soft compound filmer wheels. Next thing I'm gonna put in is some mass loaded vinyl. This is sticky back vinyl. I've selected this because it won't rot or add moisture to the ramp. You could use carpet or underlay, things like that, but I'm worried that'll trap the moisture and rot the wood. Okay, that's one of the vinyl panels in place. Not too fussed about being too neat because it's gonna be boxed off on the back. You're not gonna see this. It's just there to deaden the sound. The sticky back works pretty good, but I'm just gonna bang some staples in as well just to make sure. Okay, that's the acoustic vinyl all stuck and stapled in place on all the resonant parts of the ramp. Hopefully that will dampen down this wood, stop it vibrating. Next thing we're gonna do is just box off the ends of the ramp. I bought some OSB board, nice and cheap and fairly dense. I'm gonna cut it to shape, get it in the ends and then give it a good dousing with cuprinol to stop it from rotting. Okay, just sliding this panel in. Just so get it in place. It's a pretty snug fit. That looks pretty good. So I'm gonna put some paint on that and I can secure it in place. Okay, the paint is dry on this panel. I've fitted a bit more mass loaded vinyl to the back to try and dampen the resonance. Okay, to help deaden the sound of this coping, I've just put a bit of expanding foam down both ends. It's come out the middle, so I reckon that might help. Okay, this end's boxed in, the sun's out, ready to give it a whirl, let's see if it's dampened the noise at all. Okay, so I've extracted the audio files from the original video recordings. To do these recordings, I just use my iPhone 11, with a standard plug-in condenser microphone. When you put the files into the computer, the volume is represented as the height of the waveform. So you can see at the top, that's my ramp with no dampening and my hard wheels. And the waveform is really wide. You can see there's a lot of volume there. So let's have a listen to that one. So 
there's a lot of resonance when the wheels are going across the surface. There's also that clunking on the coping. Let's have a listen to the dampened ramp with the soft wheels. So as you can see, the waveform is probably about half of the original. A really big difference in the amount of noise when you're rolling across the surface. That's been dampened down and the soft wheels are really helping there. And also that clunking on the coping has been reduced. It's sort of now a click and a thud as opposed to a really resonant ring. So overall, I think I'm really happy with the results I've got here. Obviously, it's still really loud, but it's not annoyingly loud, going to get you in trouble loud. So I think these measures are well worth it to try and get a bit more skating done and keep everybody else on side. Some of you have been kind enough to message in and inquire as to how the ramp has been holding up, especially through these winter months. We've had a fair few heavy frosts and quite a bit of wetness. Spring is just around the corner, so it seems like a good time to do a bit of ramp maintenance, fix her up, get her ready for the summer and reflect on the various decisions and choices I made when I designed and constructed the ramp a year ago. First up, I had a quick look round the ramp and I'm pretty delighted that the ramp is structurally sound. The frame is holding together nicely and there's no signs of delamination anywhere on the riding surface or on the plywood that forms the transitions. I think this is because I got a lucky bit of advice from a carpenter friend of mine who said that I should get good quality plywood from the local timber merchant. So I went for BB grade birch ply and that seems to have held up nicely. I recorded a second mini ramp video where I made a few adjustments and added some extensions to the decks. For one of those decks, I was a little bit lazy and went for the convenience of my local high street DIY center and got some plywood from there. And oh my gosh, all I can say is I'm glad I didn't get all my plywood from there. That is delaminated. It's been bugging me for a while. So that seemed like a fitting place to start my ramp revamp. This one was a nice, easy fix. I just whipped out that old ply and went and got myself a couple of 18 mil planks. At six quid each, this was a nice, cheap and easy fix. And the results when painted were pretty pleasing. I've been getting annoyed with the board getting muddy when I veer and cavort off the side of the ramp. So I took the liberty of putting down some stones and gravel down the side. And that's been a really good fix for that muddy strip alongside the fence. I also tarted up the look of the ramp by fitting some solar powered disco lights. They worked really well and looked nice, but unfortunately I managed to break them during a session. So those will need replacing. I recorded a third video where I put some sound dampening inside the ramp. I also blocked off the ends and also put some sound deadening inside the coping. This seems to have been nicely effective. However, the biggest difference in sound dampening is using softer wheels. I've recently been cavorting around on my surf skate that has 78A durometer wheels and whooshing backwards and forwards. It's just a nice quiet and then you hit the coping and there's also a dull thud when you drop in or land a trick. Also those nippers, they love getting on there with their scooters. Those scooters have 88A durometer wheels, so still nice and soft. And when they're whizzing back and forth, again, the sound is pretty dampened. The main wear and tear has been to the paint on the plywood surface. I think the main reason that that plywood surface is structurally okay is number one, I use a cover and to keep that cover off of the plywood and to stop any water pooling, I just pull a bit of rope nice and tight down the middle and that makes a bit of a tent so that all the water can roll off. I also use bungee cords so when there's a stiff breeze, she doesn't pull the eyelets out. The second reason is I painted the surface with masonry paint. This masonry paint is pretty bog standard stuff, but I've given it quite a few coats and it seems to have really helped for the odd time that the ramp has got as wet as an otter's pocket. 
or when the ramp got really icy and frosty. However, some of this paint has come off. I've been learning to do my reverts and that revert process whoo -hoo, has scuffed some of that paint off. Also, just the general wear and tear and the frost has made some of that lift off. So it's time to give the ramp a lick of paint. First thing I did is just get a key into the existing paint by sanding all of the surfaces all over. There's also some heavy areas of wear that could do with a bit of filler. Over the past year, I've experimented with brands of wood filler and I find that they all just eventually crack and come out because the wood flexes so much. So I've ended up concocting my own custom wood filler. This is simply a bit of bog standard white wood glue with sawdust mixed into it. The sawdust provides some tensile strength and then you can just pop that in any damaged areas. It will help to seal up the wood and I find the wood glue moves and bends a bit more with the wood, doesn't tend to crack. So give that a sand back and then she's ready for a lick of paint. I apply two nice thick coats with a roller on the end of a broomstick and that was really satisfying to get a nice finish and cover up all those areas of wear. I also took the liberty of refreshing my fake tile feature. This is simply a different colour blue painted in, bit of masking tape, and then I used a silver marker to etch in the sort of fake grouting lines. Now this makes no difference to the functionality of the ramp, but it does appeal to the child in me, and it helps to create that skate pool aesthetic. Overall, I've been pretty impressed by the way the masonry paint has performed. It's also pretty handy if there's a little spot of rain mid-session. Just grab a towel, towel off a surface, and it dries a lot quicker than untreated plywood would. So following the repainting, I left it 48 hours to get that surface nicely cured, and I couldn't wait to get on there and try putting together a few lines. So here are my overall reflections on one year's worth of ramp use. Number one, the use of quality plywood. I'm pretty pleased I got that tip to get the higher quality plywood. I think it's fair to say if you use the poorer quality plywood, you're going to end up buying twice. Number two, the use of a cover and also the painting of all the surfaces of the wood has definitely helped boost the longevity of the ramp. Number three, Reflections on the design. When I was designing this ramp, my main goal was to provide something that I could progress on quickly. So I went round all the local ramps, which I felt were too tall or too steep, and I came up with a design that I felt would be suitable. A year on, I think that design has definitely helped me to progress. I've put all the dimensions of the ramp in the description. You might also wanna go back and check out the original video of the build, that will take you through the process and also outline all of those dimensions as you go. I think the key thing that I change, and it's going to be my next project, is a tightening of the radius of the ramp. I think the initial radius that I chose, which was six and a half foot, definitely helped me with the confidence of re-entering the ramp, jumping back in off of tricks and also coming back in off of stalls. However, that mellower radius is not as helpful for doing tricks where you pop out of the top or tricks where you need a lot of speed going into the other side of the coping. So now that I've progressed a bit, I am yearning for a slightly whippier, steeper ramp. I'm also finding it's a little bit of a step up to take the tricks that I've learned on my backyard mini ramp and adapt them to the ramps in all the local skate parks. So it'd be pretty handy to have a radius that's comparable in difficulty to the local ramps so that I know that when I've got the trick on my backyard mini ramp, I can easily take it into the local skate parks. 
I've also come up with the idea of a movable extension. This is simply going to be a one foot box with a little bit of transition on it and one bit of plywood that overlaps the coping with a bit of metal to feed it into the transition and a bit of coping on top. This means I can place it around the ramp and it'll give me some extra speed to set up for front side grinds, back side grinds, or any tricks where I need a little bit more zip going into them. I couldn't decide the best part of the ramp to put this extension. I also didn't want to mess with the ramp permanently because I really like it the way it is. So that led me to the idea of trying to design a movable extension I could place anywhere on the ramp. So I came up with a basic conceptual design. My ramp's just under three foot tall, so I thought a one foot extension would bring it up into the four foot territory and provide a nice challenge. As I intended the extension to be movable and also be stored in the garage, it would need to be fairly small. As my ramp is pool inspired in design, it seemed churlish not to try and source a bit of real pool coping to go on the top of this extension. And by lucky hap, my mate Richie had a piece which he kindly donated. This pool coping block started life in a swimming pool and then was used for a DIY backyard mini ramp. So I was pretty confident that it was gonna work a treat for my little extension. I gave this coping block a good clean up and a fresh spray of lacquer so she was ready to go. This coping block is two foot wide, that's 60 centimetres, and one foot deep. So I let those dimensions start to inform the design of my extension box. I also let the sizes my materials were available in dictate some of the dimensions. So for instance, a 2.4 length of two by four would make three 80 centimetre beams. So I thought if I just had an 80 centimetre width, that I'd leave 10 centimetres over either side of the coping block to allow me to get onto stools a little bit easier. I also decided on a one foot height because I could rip that out of a two foot wide piece of 18 mil plywood, which is what I'd use for the sides of the box and the transition shape. Lastly, I wanted to make sure that the board could deck out on a rock fakie with the wheels up against the coping. So I measured how long that would be to make sure my deck extended past the one foot of the coping block. To get on and off of the extension, I knew that I'd have to smooth over the coping. So I came up with a design where I had one lip of nine mil plywood going over the coping, sitting down on the surface of the ramp, and then a one millimeter thick strip of steel to save that plywood from splintering and also smooth over the transition. So it's time to get building. First stage was to do a template taken from the transition of my ramp. I did this by marking a bit of OSB board and cutting it out. And that meant that I could offer this up onto my ramp and it'd give me the transition cut taking into account how much my coping sticked out. I ripped a bit of two foot wide 18 mil plywood in half to give me two one foot planks. And then I marked up the transition on those planks so that I could then cut that out and that would leave me with the two sides of the box with the correct transition cut. I wanted to make sure that all the plywood in this project is fully painted. I'm not gonna leave it outside and it's not necessarily gonna stand a chance of getting wet, but it's damp in the shed and also there is a chance it could rain at any time. Next job was to cut all the 80 centimetre beams to length and then I offered up those beams, screwed them in from the side and that gave me the basis of my extension with all the beams screwed in. If anything I over engineered this but I needed it to be nice and strong because it was going to have me bouncing up and down on it. <laughs> Once all the beams were screwed in I popped her up on top of the ramp, placed a coping block on top and had a little stand up there to see how it felt. And oh, oh my gosh, I could see the curvature of the air from up there. It just felt ridiculously high. I think I'd overcooked it on the one foot height. So I rethought it, took it back over and trimmed off two inches, thus giving me a 10 inch extension. Next job was to screw on the riding surface. I used nine mil ply for this. First layer went on the front and then I painted that all up and then the second layer went on the front and that needed to overlap the coping. I chose to get it to overlap the coping just enough 
so that when I had my one mil metal sheet, it would overlap and fit over my existing tile effect. Again, I painted all the surfaces and then screwed that front riding surface on and it started to look like an extension. Next job was to stick down that coping block. As a coping block sits on a sort of shelf, I could move it backwards and forwards until I had the amount of relief that I wanted the coping block to stick out the front by. I used chunky Gorilla Glue to stick the coping block down. And also the way this coping block is molded, it's got sides that are on a bit of a wonk, which allowed me to then put other bits of wood that I cut with a chamfer and that would hold the coping block down. The problem with fixing a coping block onto wood is it's constantly getting knocked upwards. So anytime the wheels hit that coping going upwards, it's getting suddenly jolted off of the wood. So this chamfer hold down, in conjunction with the glue, I hoped would be enough to keep it on there. So at this point, the extension was structurally sound and good enough to try a first drop in. I got up there on the top, Ooh, definitely looks a lot different. Going for the drop in, I noticed it was a lot whippier and also it spat me out the other side with significantly more speed. To finish up the extension, I did a bit more painting. I did my fake tile effect on the top to match the rest of the ramp. This was simply a case of using a silver indelible marker and marking off all of those fake ground tin bits. I also attached my strip of one mil steel across the bottom and this would help stop the ply splintering and also smooth that transition back into the ramp. I also added some tread plate noping to those 10 centimetre segments either side of the coping stone. I thought this would be a good backup plan if I missed the coping block and I needed to lock into something else. Also the tread plate texture might stop me sliding back off the edge if I did overcook a stall or a mini grind. I gave all the edges a good file down for health and safety. This extension is pretty heavy and it holds itself in place by having the lip on the front and also I cut a little bevel out of the bottom so it fits over the coping. But just as an extra safety measure, I also put a couple of brackets on the side that I could easily screw in and out between sessions. So that was the extension all finished and ready to be ridden. I couldn't wait to try out some of my favorite tricks and also see if I could get some precision stalls on that narrow coping block. So the increased speed from that drop in gave me the extra zip I needed to learn a couple of new tricks. Riding this extension is a whole lot of fun. It definitely ups the ante in terms of challenge to get the trick and also ramifications should it go wrong. It was pretty scary at times and also felt pretty dangerous. There are a fair few thrills and spills and it definitely smarted a bit more coming off from that little bit higher up. Overall, I was really pleased with the way the extension worked out. That one mil strip of steel helps to make a smooth transition up onto the extension. It makes a bit of a racket, but after a while, I found I didn't even notice the transition between 
the normal ramp and the extension. The small width of the extension adds in a bit of proximity fear and the fear of coming off the end is very real. So I found it really rewarding to get some of those precision stalls where the wheels lock in on that coping block, which is only just wide enough. The size of this ramp is definitely on the top end of the weight that I can manhandle on my own. But I found with the use of the skateboard, I could whip it out of the shed, get it onto the ramp, and then also get it off of the ramp back onto the skateboard and pop her away for the night. Well, that's it for this video. I have to say I really enjoyed the process of building my own backyard mini ramp. It was a bit of a dream come true. And just the convenience of having it in the back garden to ride whenever I wanted really supercharged my progression. You may be wondering what happened to the mini ramp. And sadly, when I moved house, I couldn't take the ramp with me, but I managed to sell it onto a mate of mine. And I think the ramp is still going strong in their back garden. If you're interested in anything in this video, then please leave it in the comments below. And also this is a bit of a longer format video. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether you want longer videos. Maybe I can edit some other videos together or create a brand new video in the longer format. <laughs> if you're new to the channel, feel free to hit subscribe. And you can also follow me on Instagram at John Bishop Skate. As ever, my name's been John Bishop and I'll see you next time.